Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we are live at the New Life Expo. We're very glad that you're joining us again today. We're going to be speaking with Sean David Morton, who is here presenting a number of lectures, workshops, talking on UFOs and prophecy. He has been world-renowned, really, for his predictions and for his knowledge of the world of UFOs, government cover-ups, and related subjects. And uh, we're very glad to have Sean on the show again, who's going to be updating us on all that's happening and cooking worldwide. So, Sean, Thank great you, to friend. have you. It's nice to be back. Absolutely. Nice to be Good. back. Good. Good. It's nice in your house and it's nice here. So it's nice Great. in your I don't know. I guess I should look in there and I don't think I'm rude if I'm looking at the camera. Not at all. So it's look at the camera because so. those are all my friends. So. Hi. Hey. Hey. There's Julie I recognize and you. Bobby and Kelly. And, oh, hey, hey, cut that out. <laughs> that you can't stop them from doing, though. Okay, all right. Uh, Sean, why don't you, uh, since you've been traveling a lot and reflecting a lot and studying so much, you've got this. Why don't you tell us first about the newsletter and some of the stuff that you've been covering in your newsletter? Well, uh, just recently, I, I published a newsletter called the Delphi Associates Newsletter. Uh, I've been publishing it since uh, uh, early 1993. As a matter of fact, the newsletter was very much a, a reaction to a lot of the panic that was being sown by those who shall be re remain nameless, but various people who were saying that you know, California was going to fall into the ocean and that there were going to be uh, you know, gigantic disasters that were going to destroy the planet. Millennium, go, like kind uh, of the point, negative point, side of yeah, millennium, millennium thinking. Millennium fever and how everything was spinning off into the sun. Well, it's... Is it? it no, it's <laughs> not, it's not going to happen that way. Yeah. And, and I've been uh, uh, blessed with the fact that in my newsletter, I was actually able to quell some of the panic of many people who believe that uh, May 10th of 1993 that there was going to be a massive quake. I was the only person who said, look, it's going to be fine. I live here. I'm sensitive to the phenomenon. It's not going to happen. Um, I was actually on the radio going head-to-head -head with people like Gordon Michael Scallion. Mm -hmm. Back in 92, 93, mm -hmm. uh, Gordon was uh, immensely prescient. He, he publishes a, a newsletter called Earth Changes Report, right. uh, and he was very, very prescient on you know two or three very specific quakes in 91 and 92, and then he just kind of diverged, you know, basically just drove himself off the cliff and started uh, talking about a whole bunch of stuff that was nonsense and uh, uh, basically saying that California was going to fall into the ocean back in 93, and he had a world map that was... Uh, uh, the United States, 1991 to like 1996, where Colorado is the west coast of the United States. Right. And a lot of these people are actually what they're doing is that they're they're taking the various prophecies and predictions of Edgar Casey, uh, better known as the sleeping prophet from the 1930s and the 1940s, sure. who had a lot of predictions that would begin in uh, Earth change scenarios beginning in 1958, and ending in 1998. Well, now according to Edgar Casey, Edgar Casey is saying that Colorado, as of next year, will be the west Beach coast of the United States. Okay, the Denver yeah. will be beachfront property. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about this is that the consciousness of humanity has changed such where there are enough people who are actually now aware of these prophecies and predictions and are constantly constantly working and consciously working to change these prophecies and predictions. So the timeline of Edgar Casey that may have been 90 to 100 percent up until like 72 mm -hmm. has now dropped to about a 25, I'd say 25 to 35 percent success ratio. Mm -hmm. Sticky, and, and let me, uh, you know, all due to uh, people like myself who certainly stand on the shoulders of giants of people that you know do this type of thing, both astrologically with uh, Hindu Vedic astrology and uh, uh, you know our our uh, Placidian, I guess you call it Greek Roman astrology, and, you know, very psychic predictions. Of people who are very pressing. It seems that there's like a pattern where they'll hit, they'll hit, they'll hit, and then they'll have a gigantic prediction that'll miss rather spectacularly, and then they'll completely lose their lose their credibility. I have been sort of spared that because I realized that consciousness has been able to change a large a large number of things. A lot of like, for example, I mean, what I've predicted in my newsletter so far is that I predicted the uh, uh, I predicted the Northridge quake uh, out in Los Angeles. I gave the exact epicenter, the magnitudes. Um, I missed the date by less than ten days. The window I gave was uh, December twenty fifth of uh, ninety three to January seventh of. Um, uh, four, and it was actually interesting because the first of the series of quakes actually began on January 7th because there were quakes in the Santa Monica Bay, a series of rumbles in the mm. Santa Monica Bay. So there were five or six quakes that were actually leading up to the, the Northridge shift. It's very unusual things about Northridge because it's my belief that Los Angeles is the fifth chakra of the planet or the, the, the throat or voice chakra, uh, the entertainment business, yeah. uh, that which is heard and spoken 
and seen all across the world through music, through television, through films, is spoken there in Los Media. Angeles. <laughs> now the sixth chakra, which I've been teaching for many years, which is the third eye chakra, is Osaka, Japan. That's why you have the big red circle on the flag of Japan that doesn't represent the rising sun. That actually represents the red dot of consciousness of the sixth chakra at the forehead. Mm. Well, isn't it interesting that we have the fifth chakra, which activates with a quake on January 17th at 5... 26 a.m. of 1994, and exactly one year and one minute later, at 5.27 a.m. on oh. January 17th of 1995, we have the earthquake in Kobe. And Kobe is exactly the distance from Los Angeles to Northridge, uh, exactly the dis distance to Osaka, as Los Angeles is to Northridge. It's, a, it's approximately about 30, oh. 30 miles or so. Interesting. So it's interesting how you can actually see... There's that parallelism. Mm -hmm. And when you understand the the chakra points of the planet, which is a lot of what I talk about, yes. you've got the base root chakra, which is Lhasa, Tibet. You've got the, uh, the, the second chakra, which is the prostate ovarian chakra, the balance of the male-female energy, which is the Great Pyramid of Giza, mm -hmm. which is why there has always been a pyramid at Giza. As a matter of fact, this pyramid, uh, that's currently there now, was rebuilt from a much older pyramid. Uh, this pyramid was probably built 12,005 BC is what we believe. Mm -hmm. But that pyramid, if you look at the northwest corner of the pyramid, is actually built on an older pyramid than before that, mm -hmm. which I believe was built circa 200,000 BC, and then another pyramid before that. That pyramid stabilizes the land masses on the planet. It's at the exact epicenter of all the land masses on the planet, and there will always be a pyramid there because of the balancing factor. But that's the second chakra, the prostate ovarian chakra. Just parenthetically, do you feel or believe that the Atlanteans technology was there in service to the Egyptians, oh, yes. if they, to if, the construction of it, the later temp, uh, later pyramid? If it was built in 12,500, then that probably means with the records that we've managed to uncover that there was a great flood or catastrophe in Atlantis, that very, very tall, blonde giants actually came from Atlantis, mm -hmm. lived in Egypt for a period of time, built the pyramids and actually saved a, a lot of their technology. Because you have to remember, too, that, that supposedly, according to the establishment party line theory of, uh, of the pyramids, those pyramids were built less than 100 years after the Step Temple of Zoser, which is junk. It's, a, you know, it's just mm. a pile of rock. Mm -hmm. And where did this technology go? They didn't yeah. use it. They didn't where did it come from? Anything else and where sure. did it come from? Right. So the gist of this is, is that there's actually more proof to prove the hypothesis that the Sphinx and the pyramid predate the 5,000 year old dating. Oh, yeah. And we well, John Anthony West was also John instrumental. West was doing it. There was a lot of, in lot of other redating. People. But this sure. is what I think, and this is, relates to that because sort of, they're yeah. going around the world. Yeah. Big prophecy here. My big prophecy is that because every attempt by Western governments and archaeologists to uncover the lost library of Atlantis, which I believe is somewhere under the Giza Plateau, mm -hmm. and actually, here's a, kind of a, a, a shocking theory for you. I think that it's not just under the Giza Plateau. I think that the Lost Library of Atlantis is the Giza Plateau. And that this library, the reason the plateau is raised the way it is, uh -huh. 7.3 square miles, the reason it's raised up the way it is is because it's a gigantic library. And this gigantic library has the Sphinx and the pyramids built on top of it. Think about that. And it's so big and so far under and so well protected that yeah. you just missed it. It's like a giant elephant. It's like know. the nose in front of your face exactly. or the giant exactly. so elephant why, sitting behind us. Why is it a plateau? I mean, when, sure. you try, when you actually try to get geological survey maps of the plateau from the government, it's very difficult. They don't give them to you. There's a, uh, there's a lot of problems with... Um, it's just a, it's a, there's, they there's politicized nothing. it. Right. And, right. and right. every single time you get some new evidence or, or some new proof, uh, Zahi Hawass and the Egyptian government steps in and stops them. The classic example of this was the uh, the German scientist with the uh, with the Upuat, which was the little robot that went up the star shaft in the Queen's Chamber, mm -hmm. where he found a block at the end that had two copper handles on it, a piece of wood, which means if we got the piece of wood, something organic, we'd be actually able to you date, could date it when sure. that plug was actually put in there. Yeah. Um, and he's offered to pay and finance for a second expedition where, where at the front part of the block, the front part of the block is a is a uh, is a crack in the crevice. Well, what uh, if, um, 
I forget the man's name. I'm sorry. It's uh, Wolfgang. I forget the name of the scientist, so I apologize. What's up? He wanted to take a second Upuat that was actually this little robot that would go up the star yep. that would then have a fiber optic camera that would go underneath that crack or underneath that to see what was on the other side. Uh, Egyptian government closed him down, wouldn't let him do it. Uh, we tried to go in with ultrasound equipment, wouldn't let us do that. There's a lot of things that go on that the minute you try to start to try to prove something, they close you down. I, I think it's sort of, I think the opinion of the Egyptians would actually be that it would sort of be like us saying that, uh, you know, that the America never went to the moon. Or that uh, yeah. know, it, wasn't achieved, it wasn't something Some we achieved. Some major denial. Yeah, it seems to take something away from the Egyptian people and yeah. their history and what it is, they, what it is they're, they're proud of. Sure. If you say, oh, 12,000 years ago, someone, marauders came here from another continent and built the pyramids and, you know, there you it's go. largely ego again. Let's right. just return for the sake of time. Oh, it's wait, my, been, my, my prediction, my oh, prophecy. Okay. The, the prediction <laughs> is that because every single time we have tried to get into under the, under the library, yeah. it is my belief that by the end of 1998, that there's going to be a massive earthquake in Egypt. And I think the earthquake is actually going to fracture the right shoulder of the Sphinx ah. and open up a series of corridors. And I think that, and only then, is when we're actually going to start to find... And uh, blow the uh, lid off the it, library. so to speak. Yeah. One of the things, too, is, is that they found a crevice in the... In the paw. Temple, no, 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 no not oh, the paw. No. In the temple complex, which is to the right of the paw, there is a sort of diamond-shaped crevice. It's just about the size of a kind of a triangular manhole cover that you can actually go down inside. Hmm. You can go up about 50 yards towards the pyramid, and then there's a uh, there's a huge red granite block that seems to plug that passageway. So there's a lot of debate as to can we drill through that? Can we put a fiber optic camera through it? Will it be removed? Etc. Mm. Etc. When I was there in December, the whole thing was flooded. It had rained and rained and rained, so there was a lot of water there. So I wasn't actually able to go down into the crevice and you know go up to where it's at. So so you think that basically the lid is going to be blown off? I think by the, next year. The library. Right? Yeah, by next year. And I, but I think by it's going to be blown off by. Uh, I think a quake, earthquake, an earthquake yeah. that's going to fracture the Sphinx complex that will open up some new things that will allow people to, to discover more. Yeah, that's my. Well, that'll that's be my, and, and also verify um, speculations and inferences and uh, intuitions that people have had for a long time right. about the relationship of first of all the existence of Atlantis and the uh, relationship of Atlantean technology to Egyptian yeah. culture. Very smart to say. Well, what can so I tell what else you? What, what else so you why don't we, since you went, I want to get into the prophecy, but since okay. you began enumerating, Sean, the different chakras of okay. the planet, why don't we finish that thought, third, third and then we'll come back. Third chakra is uh, Stonehenge, England. The Salisbury Plain at Stonehenge, England, which is why you have the crop circle phenomenon that's been going on there. Those crop circles are a form of mathematical, musical, geometric language mm. that's actually being taught to the planet in the form of symbols. You actually meditate on those crop circles. It's very interesting the areas of the brain that they that they begin to open up. Wow. They're prophecies for some people. They're messages for other uh, others. Um, I believe it's also a warning. I believe that there's a benevolent intelligence out there that is creating these crop circles in such a way to warn the darker forces on this planet that their time is up and that they are to either leave or they will be forcibly driven out in mass. The uh, fourth chakra of the planet is kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of odd. The actual chakra point is Easter Island, which used to be the mm. capital or, the, or literally the... Uh, uh, and, and Stonehenge being the third chakra is also the solar plexus. So right. it's very interesting how the British have, with their non-emotional uh, non-emotional nature and hey, keep a stiff up and lip and all that, that's been cracked. Intellectual types. Uh, that intellectualism, that's been cracked wide open because of the death of Princess Diana. So that solar plexus chakra is now connecting them in a feeling, very visceral way, almost like a punch in the, in the, in the bread basket. Yeah. To, uh, uh, it's a step before the heart opens, exactly, actually. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. To the energy. So it's very interesting thing that then when you've got the fourth chakra, which is the heart chakra, which is Easter Island, since none of the energy is being worked on Easter Island, there's like two ventricles to the heart chakra, and the secondary chakra to Easter Island is Machu Picchu. And Machu Picchu is where the feminine aspect of the god ray strikes the planet at the sacred mountains in the Andes. The masculine aspect of the god ray strikes the planet at uh, the five sacred mountains in Tibet, at the base root chakra. So you got the base root chakra being Lhasa, the prostate ovarian chakra, the second chakra, which is Cairo, the third chakra, which is solar plexus, is, is um, Stonehenge. Stonehenge. Fourth chakra, which is a combination like the ventricles of the heart, Machu Picchu, Easter Island. The fifth chakra is Los Angeles, California, which is the throat or the voice chakra. Right. You know, they say people from 
know why you're all talk. Well, that's that's why. <laughs> and the six chakra, which is the uh, uh, has a lot to do with with cameras, with high definition television, with visual acuity, is Osaka, Japan, which makes perfect sense. I mean, this yep. is where this camera was made. Yep. As an example, everything yep. has to do with this area of the sure. uh, of the mind. It's also all very, seeing eye. You know, it's very interesting too because it puts a lot of pressure on that area. Uh, it's unusual because a genetic trait of the Japanese is usually they have very weak eyesight, and hmm. so it puts a lot of pressure on that area of the face. So it's interesting. Um, it's an and there's no seventh chakra on the planet because this is not a sacred world yet, and that's why the Great Pyramid of Giza doesn't have a capstone. Wow. Now, say more about that if you would. It doesn't have. What a is the point? It, the point of it is, is that the, the and what do we do to um, to congregate? Okay, the Great Pyramid has always been representative mathematically of the planet Earth. You know, you were supposed to be on that trip with us a couple of years ago with Sandra Michael to Egypt. You, myself, a oh, well, few they, others. They canceled all the things, I remember. No, that. I went. I was the main person with how the group. Many, how many people did they have? Eleven, all of us. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I saw it. Next to go time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, you. The, the Great Pyramid is built mathematically to represent the planet Earth. It has five sides. It's a tomb because spiritually to the Egyptians, they believed that uh, that Earth, that life, was a was a was a tomb. That you're a, only awake and alive. That you're only awake and alive. And uh, that you're only that you're only awake and alive when you're in the spirit world, and that when you take on a physical body, that your senses are limited, that your powers are limited. And so, to them, because the Earth was not a sacred planet, because our evolution had been sidetracked, the pyramid does not have a capstone. Every single time that Jesus, as the Messiah, referred to himself, he always said, I am the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. There's only one mm. building that has a chief cornerstone, and that is a great pyramid. Uh, that's the great pyramid, yeah. the, top of the top of a pyramid. So every time he's referred to, uh, for example, another example is when uh, the Pharisees came out and said, you know, shut these people up singing Hosanna and praising you. He said, if I was to hush every voice, the very stones would sing my name. That means that he was predicting. as the central core messianic figure being born in 2 BC and that he was the central messianic figure of which it then predicts another messianic figure coming in 2034. So, and that, after another thousand years, the capstone is then replaced onto the top of the pyramid and mankind then joins the Galactic Federation again. But that's... 2034. Well, that's when the next Messiah comes. Okay. But it also states that that's the next main central Messiah and that there's five more Messianic figures um, that incarnate very much like the Dalai Lama does, where, the, yeah. where you have one Dalai Lama who leaves a body and then picks it's up a body. It's a lineage, right, sure. And that this goes on for the next age of enlightenment of mankind for the next 500 years. These Messianic figures are then no longer needed on the planet. Man lives on his own for another 500 years. And then somewhere around the year 3000, the four squared city of Jerusalem descends from the sky, and that represents the completion of the capstone placed on the pyramid, and then you've got a perfected planet. You've got a sacred world again. So this yeah. is all in the time coding in the pyramid, in the three corridors that lead down into the pit, which is the, the, the well of souls, those people who are lost and just won't learn anything. Then you've got the Queen's Chamber people who are kind of like the yuppies who just want their stuff and their material things and they don't care about doing anything for others or working on their spirituality. And then you have the King's Chamber, because the King's Chamber then is those who are actually on the path moving upwards towards Godhead. And of course, not only upwards through Godhead, but the empty sarcophagus represents our eventual conquest of death. And the conquest of death means being able to condense the cores of our memories, literally like a ball or a sphere, the essence of what we are, shuffle off just one physical form and then take up another form with no lapse in the memory, no no mm -hmm. veil being no dropped. No forgetfulness, yes, no amnesia. Right. Being dropped right. between you and the creator. Or the, or yeah, whatever. exactly. Wow, <laughs> that was a great well, sentence. No, it's, I mean, I, I, <laughs> no, it was I lived, wonderful. I, I, I lived in Egypt. You've delivered us. Yeah, oh, nice. yeah, I lived in Egypt when I was a kid. Right, I, sure. I actually I had the, the honor when I was about 15, 16 years old of having like old Hebrew scribes walk through the pyramid with me and show me all the various corners and angles and say, "This means this," and here's the interpretation. And um, and it's really given me a a, a powerful tool to be able to know what's going on as far as the various trends of the earth because it's, a lot of it is written right there. I also have projected myself about a, about 100 years in the future instead of past life. You studied, and I think people ought to really know this, that you had studied with Tibetans to do uh, future projections. Yeah, is that I, correct? I was in, um, in, a in 1980, monastery. In 1986, 85, 86, I took the year off. I yeah. traveled around the world, and I lived for 
eight months at a place called Pangbache, which is on the, it's right at the foot of Amadam Waram. It's about 30 clicks down from Mount Everest. And I was there for eight months, and they, they, they do a lot of past life regressive work. And the reason they do past life regressions is because they say it's like, um, so many people are like a man who gets drunk in a town. And he pinches some girl on the backside and punches some guy in the nose and leaves without paying his bill. Guy doesn't remember anything that happened, wanders into the town, woman comes up and slaps him, guy comes up, punches him out, <laughs> and the cop arrests him for walking out of his bill. The guy's sitting, and the guy's sitting in jail not knowing what he did. So that's exactly what our karmic lives are like. Everybody's sure. coming back at us trying to collect their debts and what, what we owe them with our not knowing what the debt is. So by understanding your past life... It appears as one thing, but it's quite another. Yes, correct, right. Yeah. So under by understanding your past lives and existences, you can take care of your karma and work on dharma. Yes. Karma's like credits, bills. Dharma's like money in the bank. And then I just did, I've done a number of future life progressions yeah. where instead of doing past life progressions, you go instead of the past, future. once you do that, you go into the future and then you see what things are like there. Right. Right. So, so from that, you were, and between that experience and your background, your childhood growing up in Egypt, well, to I some extent, for two years, but it's, yeah. uh, but you seem to have gathered a whole lot in that well, short amount of time. It was great because yeah. the whole country was open to us because we as Americans were just you know, we were loved. I mean, exactly, they we loved were the us. cats meow yeah. at that time. Yeah, because they, <laughs> they, hated, they hated the Russians. They knew we were the only sure. people protecting them from the Russians. Yeah. They had just turned from Russia to the United States, so you know I had carte blanche of the country, and this was when nobody was going there. There were no yeah. tourists. There was sure. none of this stuff going on. Still most of it was like relatively early from Germany and yeah. Russia. So we had a Americans there, they just opened up everything. Sure. Now, you've given us uh, the larger picture, so to speak, into and up to around the year 3000 and what you could really describe as the emergence and deliverance of humankind, where we are finally reaching the goal of life on Earth, right. which is this um, perfectedness, the completion of the seventh chakra. Um, now, prior to that, and thank him, I hope that we can actually do another show and enunciate a bit more of that, but I just would like to touch on the shorter term, okay, sure. which is, well, here we are in 1997, right. and we've got the next several years out where there are such fabulous uh, predictions, and I mean in relative to the idea of fable mm -hmm. as well, that, uh, you know, Asteroids are coming, meteors are coming, many channels have said many different things about this. What is your feeling? Um, okay. Uh, kind of a nuclear winter kind uh, of thing. You, you, you I don't this. mean there's, to say take cover, <laughs> but something like that. There's 831 days left in the millennium from today, left in the year 2000. What we're, what we're looking at is we're looking at, we're looking at a graduation. It's not a funeral, it's a graduation. We're graduating from one plane to the next. It's not the end of things. What is going to happen, uh, for example, I, I, there is a meteor which doesn't exactly hit the Earth, but it, it actually comes pretty close by 2012. Uh, astronomers are now telling us... That are you saying that that's the first significant yeah, uh, meteor I, I, activity? I don't think or? anything's going to hit us, and the reason I don't think anything's going to hit us is because we have probably one of the most amazing global defense systems that has to do with Star Wars and a lot of the stuff that's been developed at places like Area 51 and Pine Gap, Australia, and mm -hmm. Sandia, that they've got the technology to track this stuff and blow it out of the sky. What I do see happening is that by 2012, there is a, I think it's called U-38, I think, is the na actual name of the asteroid. But there's an asteroid that astronomers are expecting a very, very large chunk of rock that is going to skim the outer layer of the atmosphere in 2012, late 2012. And I think that this begins actually in 2012 where we either hit this with something or it shatters in the upper atmosphere. And from that kind of thing, I don't think we have a defense. From the bigger rocks, we can actually defend ourselves through rockets or through lasers or through some amazing technology we have. But if one of these things shatters and we have a lot of smaller pieces break up, say, in the you know, mid to low atmosphere, uh -huh. uh, it'll cause, uh, you know, I think sort of a river of fire that'll destroy a lot of things. In the shorter term, what yeah. you're looking at is that as of October 1st of 1997, we're beginning what I'm what I call the year of hell. It's it's actually 
October 1st of 97 is significant. One, it's my birthday. Two, it's Rosh Hashanah, which means it's the Feast of the Trumpets, which means that it is the next... Everything happens actually according to the planet on a lunar calendar. So yes. you have to watch stock surges and various uh, psychic events and earthquake events. They all occur on a lunar, a lunar based calendar, lunar calendar. Well, who has the best lunar calendars? The Jews. Well, the Jews, yeah, because they've got a, a, a lunar based calendar. So October 1st is, I believe, the year, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but I think it's like 5738 or so. But this year is marking the end of a 200 year cycle for the United States. And when I say that, it is my belief that the United States actually confederated and became a nation and the clock began ticking September 27th of 1791, which is when all the 13 mm -hmm. colonies came together and adopted the Bill of Rights. We mm -hmm. did not have a solid government that was agreed to by the states until the Bill of Rights was adopted. Yes. This began a 200-year clock. Every 200 years, there are certain things that you have to do, and this is hopefully we don't have enough time to talk about it, but there are certain things you have to do every seven years. Repudiate all debts, free all petty criminals, break all contracts, mm. basically give everybody a chance to start over once every New seven lease, years. So New lease on life every seven right. years. And every 50 years, you do all of that. You let the land lie fallow, which means you don't grow crops for two years. Now, is this biblical that you're quoting right now? This is all yes, the, okay. These are all the biblical patterns. And the biblical patterns are, like. is that... In the 50th year, you let the land life fallow for two years, and then you give all the land back to the people that originally owned it. Because every 50 years, all the land changes hands, mm -hmm. either through either willingly or through some kind of bloody revolution. Yes. You don't do that after four cycles of 50, 200 years. Your nation then goes into a seven-year tribulation period in which there are fires, floods, earthquakes, economic catastrophe, and your nation is basically destroyed. We're at the end of that seven-year period right now. And October 1st of 1997, you're mm. going to see within the next year the worst floods in U.S history, the worst winter in U.S. history. You're going to see hurricanes and very high winds and even the jet stream coming down. Is this down the El Nino the effect as El well? El Nino in, in the western part of the United States. You're going to see San Diego and California, and California hit with Florida-like hurricanes for the first time, uh, which is going to devastate them because we're, we're not prepared for it at all. Uh, you're going to have massive rains in northern California, which is going to break the dike system in Sacramento. It's going to cause massive flooding. What you're seeing now is you're seeing all the old rippers, like the Mississippi, like the Missouri, uh, like the Russian River and the in the, uh, in the in the California Delta, they are all going back to their ancient courses, and there is nothing we're going to be able to do to stop it. The polar ice cap is beginning to melt. The uh, you know, the planet is getting warmer. The next trigger is going to be I predicted Montserrat erupting two years ago. Mm -hmm. Montserrat Montserrat blows. The next one is going to be Mount Pilet. After that is going to be Mount Baker, which is above Mount Rainier, and hopefully, uh, well, I hope not, but I think that the trigger is going to be uh, Mount Rainier, and I think Mount Rainier blowing is then. Mm. Going to trigger a cloud of ash across the United States, which will lower the temperature of the North American continent by some three degrees. Hmm. But 1999, this two-year cycle between 98 and 99, is going to be the beginning of a 40-year exodus period in which there's going to be so many people that are going to check off the planet, either die through disease or through war or what have you. And also in 99 too, watch for the next major world conflict, which is going to begin in Bosnia, Serbia, Herzegovina, with mm. all the various forces of the world all sort of coming together. So, wow. I mean, that's a little little stuff for you there. Oh, yeah. 98 Definitely. to 2002, I think it's going to be a global war, then after that, a very substantial plague. And I'm sorry, we what about more details. Yeah, sure. Out of time. And there's, uh, you know, also the, one since you're getting all biblical, <laughs> the entire age of peace. Well, look, you're going to still be in New York a little Which bit longer. Start in 2034 after the Messianic figure comes. So that's when we got another 40-year period of where we have to sort of wander around in the desert for that period of time. Here we go again. <laughs> Sean, thanks so much for sure, being on you, the man. show. It's a joy. And Absolutely. Thank you, Mary Ann. Lovely camera lady. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. This is Mitchell J. Raven for A Better World, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. <laughs>